Good morning and welcome back. Welcome to the CBI at 10. Uh, and a particularly warm welcome to Tony Danker, the new Director General of the CBI. Tony, really good to see you. Thank you uh, for doing this. I, I say that you're new, but in the year that we've had, being a week into the job, you know, that's not so new these days. Actually, you've probably had to deal with a fair bit. And I know you've been on something of a listening tour. So I hope that we're going to have a chance in this next 45 minutes to talk a little bit about the CBI, about you, about how you see it. But should we start with where we are in the world in terms of Brexit and, and COVID? You, you'll have seen these calls. You know, the aim is that we hear yeah. from CBI members. They'll, they'll come to you with points of view, with questions, and I'll weave those in. But, but do you want to start? People's minds today are obviously going to be on what does or doesn't happen in terms of a deal on Brexit. Do you want to talk about what you're, what you're hearing and, and where you think this goes next? Sure. Well, look, first of all, it's a huge pleasure to be here and it's a huge privilege to do this job. There's been no honeymoon period, as you say. We're a week in and there's quite a lot happening in the world. In fact, Michael Gove on Thursday in the regular Brexit uh, task force, which we'll talk about, said I must be out of my mind to have joined the CBI at this stage. But it's a huge honour and a huge privilege and a hugely important time. So thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, look, uh, what can we say about Brexit? It's a very, very frustrating time if you're a business person, because any business person who's ever done a deal, even a long, complicated, high stake deal, look at this from a sort of deal perspective and think this is doable, right? There's enough variables in the controversial issues to find win-wins. And yet this is not about business. This is politics. It's peak politics time. So it's incredibly uh, frustrating. But I all I would say, and I said it already this morning in an FT interview, is anyone that's ever done a deal knows that, you know, uh, the last leg requires the biggest leap, right? There is just a moment when the boss on both sides has to come in and take a lead. Uh, so we don't really know where things are. You know, there's lots of rumor mill and I talked to everybody I could talk to and all the views are conflicting. But I think one thing is true, which is it's going to take leadership on both sides to get through it. Uh, it really matters, by the way. I mean, we've had the OBR uh, data out around the spending review. It said, you know, there's a 2% delta between deal and no deal of GDP next year. That's a lot of money, right? Probably a lot of jobs. Uh, and if you are in the agriculture sector or you're in the automotive sector, you know, some of the tariff hikes are enormous. They're business defining. Uh, you know, just take haulage, you know, if there's no deal, there's 4,000 permits to get across Europe and there's about 40,000 people who need them. So we'll get into that, I think, in a moment. At this stage, what we're very focused on, uh, we are, of course, pushing for a deal, as is everybody, uh, but we're very focused in deal or no deal, the cliff edge, the mm -hmm. December 31st, January 1st moment. And by the way, one thing that we agreed with uh, Michael Gove last week is that that cliff edge is not a one day, it's not a 24 hour thing, right? This is not, you know, if we all, those of us who are old enough to remember year 2K, we're all, Y2K, we're all waiting for something to happen. This Brexit transition, deal or no deal, will take us into the first half of next year. So I'm happy to come on and say a little bit more, James, about all of that and what we're pushing for and what we're asking for. But uh, you know, this is peak politics. It's not peak business. So for some of us who are used to doing deals, this is quite frustrating. So Tony, can you talk us through a bit on the practical side then? Yeah. So first, talk about these meetings with Michael Gove. What, what's happening in those? What's the, what's the plan with those beyond the end of the year? Yeah, so look, just to remind it to everybody, uh, the Prime Minister and Michael Gove had a call with business about uh, three or four weeks ago. Uh, Carolyn did a really good job uh, on behalf of us all, a parting gift. She uh, convinced the prime minister to set up a Brexit task force, uh, and that's focused entirely on transition. So it's chaired by Michael Gove. It's got business organizations on the call, uh, us and some of uh, the others. And each week we pick a different sector. So I think the first week was agriculture and food. Uh, th and uh, this week, the first one that I joined, because Josh has been doing them on our behalf, was business and professional services. And what it's really designed to do is hear from us about the issues that we think present themselves as immediate risks. Uh, and actually, it's been getting more and more serious as a, as, as a group, as a task force every week. Uh, credit to Michael Gove. He's brought increasing numbers of ministers and senior officials from relevant departments. Uh, and we're really hitting a stride now, I think, in terms of raising issues. Sometimes the government can ask, answer them there and then. Other times they pledge to come back to us. 
And it's starting to get a feel a bit similar to what we had with the Chancellor over the furlough scheme and what we had with Bayes and DH over guidance. It's starting to have a real sleeves up working relationship feel. So I'm really pleased with the way it's going. And most importantly, on last week's meeting, last Thursday's meeting, uh, the government pledged to keep the group running throughout the first half of the year. So it's not going to shut down at the beginning of January. I'm very happy to come on and talk about the kinds of things we need to get into, but that's the sort of logistics of the group, so to speak. And, and Tony, if you're a business who thinks, look, we're not agriculture and food, or we're not business and professional services, but we are, let's say, for example, haulage or transport, yeah. how do you... How how do you log in with you to sort of get that on the on Michael Gove's agenda for one of those meetings? Yeah, well, look, email me directly or speak to your uh, account manager or use the regular channels through regional directors and so on. It all filters up immediately. Uh, whenever we are preparing uh, with Michael Gove and his team for the week's uh, agenda, we'll send them some feedback in advance so that actually we get straight to it. So just feed it through to CBI, whatever your usual contact is. We are doing a very good job of rounding all that up and then sharing it with the government so it gets more and more constructive. Um, well, just to give you a flavor of the kind of things that we are saying to them, I, I won't go into sector detail and, and sort of until you're ready, but look, the first thing is we need to change any agreement or any non-agreement into guidance. Right. I mean, businesses out there, our members will be thinking, what am I supposed to do? Read a thousand pages of a deal or am I supposed to read the FT of the Times to work out what's going on? We are pushing the government that the most immediate thing they need to do is translate any outcome. Let's assume it's a deal from sort of legal text into guidance, proper guidance. The second thing are what we call uh, the jargon is facilitations. Right. It's those things that actually they're going to need some bridging. You're going to have to smooth the cliff edge. Some of those are in the agreement or uh, non-agreement, but some of them are outside a free trade agreement anyway. For example, financial services or data adequacy, which we'll come back to. And then the third thing we're really pushing for is that day-to-day -day problem solving, a bit like we've had under COVID, which is that actually every day we're solving issues one by one, uh, and we're really rolling up our sleeves together. So whatever it might require, it might require new guidance or it might require communication to uh, the European side or it might require you know, logistical issues like putting more border officers on or fixing the IT glitches. So whatever it is, that'll be the third thing that we're looking for, a continued dialogue, day-to-day -day problem solving. And, and, and um, Tony, do you want to just dig into that facilitation piece of it? Yeah. What kinds of things are you trying to get done there? Well, look, I think let, let's assume there's a deal scenario. I mean, there's facilitations in either event. And remember, they're all about smoothing the uh, the cliff edge. So if there is a deal scenario, I think the first one is, well, in both scenarios, actually, is data adequacy. Uh, so data is not part of the free trade agreement, but uh, all of us have spent the last two or three years becoming GDPR compliant. And on the face of it, on January the 1st, holding data uh, of Europeans uh, is not facilitated for. It's, it's illegal, so to speak. And so what we need is we need the EU to be able to say that actually uh, there is data adequacy. In other words, the way that British firms, because of GDPR, are handling data is adequate. Uh, and the Brits have said, we're ready to do that. It should take the Europeans a couple of days. At the moment, the Europeans have said nothing about it because they don't want it to be used as sort of negotiating tactic. They're waiting to see uh, what happens with the deal and then data adequacy kicks in next. So that's a very important one. You know, if you're a hotel and you're holding a booking from an Italian tourist next January, in theory, you're not allowed to hold that data. So hopefully that one gets sorted. The second one is around financial services, making sure there's equivalence. Again, financial services not really in their free trade agreement. So making sure that uh, financial services institutions can still serve customers across Europe, uh, and that is managed pretty quickly. The others are much more about, uh, I think, sort of grace periods, the recognition that things are going to take some time to implement. So the first one is around rules of origin. Uh, as you know, you need to ascertain whether or not a good is British or European or, or some other. Uh, and there's lots of, you know, there are a lot of members probably listening who, you know, if, if they're Northern Irish, they may, their goods or their, their agricultural product is part UK, part Irish. The automotive sector is the most famous one, which is using component parts from around the world. So if all of a sudden you find yourself foul of rules of origin uh, guidelines, then can we not execute those overnight? Can we try and create a softer landing? Uh, 
all the relabeling and the registering. So if you're uh, in the sort of health and safety business or you, you produce products that need CE marks, for example, getting that all done overnight is going to be you know, pretty impossible. You might be getting ready, but you don't really know which goods. And so you don't know if it affects you. All of that stuff is going to need a bit of forbearance before we implement it. Um, and then obviously the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, might be the most difficult and all the GB to NI stuff that needs to take place that a lot of our members are confronting. Again, can we please make sure that, you know, in Stranraer, all of a sudden overnight, we don't have chaos. Uh, and so those are the kinds of areas we've prioritized. And by the way, if we've missed something or, or, or you're sitting listening to this and saying, I'm really worried, there's something existential that you haven't mentioned, please send it through to us. Just to be clear, you mentioned Holliers. If, if we're in a no deal scenario, then the three the three top of our list are data adequacy, uh, aviation, obviously, the ability to fly in and out uh, and all the transit and trucking stuff, which is which is obviously huge if there's no deal. So that's not to say there aren't other things, but those are our, on our top list. If you think we've missed something, then send it through. And Tony, that's there's uh, as uh, as with the work the CBI has done with COVID-19, actually a large part of it has been that go-between role, hasn't it? Flagging yeah. up the go. And just to say to people on the call, you know, if you've got a question for Tony, or if you actually just want to flag something to him, do put it in the chat. You'll see there's that questions box. If you're new to the CBI at 10, you can just write in. And if it's sensitive, one of the things we've always said is just write anonymous or anon at the beginning of your question, and then we won't cite you but we will fl flag it up and i'll bring it into the conversation with tony um tony one thing before we leave leave brexit which is yeah. imagine you know i like your phrase peak politics i imagine for a lot of businesses there they're like can we just get hyper practical and one of the questions will be in the event of a no deal brexit yeah what happens in that if you like week after christmas couple three weeks into January, when clearly there's going to be a lot of uncertainty. What's the sort of CBI plan B for a no deal? Yeah, well, look, deal or no deal, we have the same plan, which is essentially we've got a Brexit war room and a Brexit transition team and preparedness team, and uh, they're going to be working over Christmas. I felt incredibly guilty. As you can imagine, the CBI team are all exhausted from the year. I imagine everybody out there has got exhausted uh, staff from the year. Everybody's looking forward to Christmas. I was feeling a little bit anxious about raising with the team the need to have a service up and running. But some of our team have been working on Brexit for four years. They're not going anywhere. They're absolutely dedicated to making sure that people are supported. We have a transition hub at the moment, which is similar to the coronavirus hub. We're going to really dial that up. There's going to be more information. And we're probably going to have a daily news service for members over the Christmas period. Uh, look, uh, sometimes we won't have answers. So please forgive us if we don't have the answers to all the questions. That's because there are no answers. But what we'll do a good job for everybody is in curating what we know, in curating the best places to go for advice, uh, and curating you know, some of the examples from members about how they're approaching things. Deeply, deeply practical stuff. It's not going to be high politics. If, if you want to know the politics of Brexit coming up to December 31st, you know, watch Laura Koonsberg, etc. We'll be doing very gritty, very practical, guidance-oriented activity every day. Okay, Tony, thank you. Um, I, I'll bring in any sort of thoughts or questions on, on Brexit. We come to those probably at the, at the end now, Tony, because I'd like to just get a quick readout from you on sort of COVID at the beginning of this this yeah. week. Just to flag up, as you know, we are talking to Ben Osborne, the MD of Pfizer in the UK on Thursday morning. So we've got a chance really to get to understand vaccine rollout and all of the knock-on implications of that. So that's a proper COVID session. So this is, if you like, just an update um, to give us time to yeah. talk more about the CBI next year. Yeah, that's right. Uh, look, I'm Ben will be, I mean, obviously that'll be a, I, I imagine that'll be a hugely popular session. Much as I'm delighted to have everybody on here today, I, I hopefully we'll have a big crowd on Thursday and we'll hear firsthand from Ben uh, what a year Pfizer have had. Uh, I'll say just a few things about COVID if I may, just so that everybody understands how we're uh, approaching COVID. I won't go through uh, where we are in COVID tiers and how they differ in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, which of course they do. But uh, just to give you a clear sense of what's on our mind as we go through this COVID process uh, for the next few weeks. The first one is obviously there's going to be, you know, an announcements every two weeks. There's going to be shifts every two weeks. And much as we've always wanted people to have lots of warning and be forewarned, obviously the whole point of the two week window is for the government to make the trade-offs as late as possible with latest data, which hopefully works in our favor because hopefully things are moving in the right direction. 
but we're asking them to be as transparent as possible about the data that they're gathering, about the assessments that they're making, about the criteria that they're using, so that people can be as forewarned as possible for if there's going to be uh, you know, shifts in any of the tiering. Um, the second thing I think we'll keep doing is trying to explore wherever there's an opportunity to bring more COVID, soft, uh, COVID safe operations into play so that we can open up more of the economy safely. That becomes an overriding priority for us, always has been. We saw it with the uh, with the hospitality, the curfew being moved back by an hour, which sadly you know, is good, but not good enough if you're a hospitality business right now in the middle of the golden quarter. Uh, the other thing we're working on, obviously, is uh, is testing, test and release and vaccines, the role that businesses can play in rolling out all of the above, because that's pretty important, uh, as well as, of course, maintaining a dialogue with the government around financial support. Uh, in January, uh, in the first quarter of next year, the JRS, the loans, all of that gets reviewed. And we're working already uh, with the Treasury uh, to try and feed into uh, the review of the uh, JRS. So if you have got any insight, we'll be reaching out to you. Don't worry, we will be getting a lot of member input for that stuff. But if there's anything that you think we haven't heard or if there's anything that's changing, please feed it in as ever, because we are in, in a pretty much a live exercise of capturing that every day and feeding new stuff into government when we have it. Tony, thank you. I mean, I'm sure we will. It's so amazing how fast this thing has come around because you now begin to hear businesses talking about, you know, the, the, about debt in a way that, that, that we weren't talking about even two, three months ago as people are looking into the spring. So the chance to talk about that financial support, I think will be really useful. Yeah. Um, why don't we, Tony, why don't we if, we, if we might, people will have, some people have seen the FT article, some people might have seen the, the Times coverage too, but, but should we just start a little bit with, you know, as you say, everyone's exhausted, everyone thinks like it's December, you're actually a week into a new job, and so do yeah. you want to give us that zip of energy, which is, what, what do you feel you want to, to do with it, what do you feel now is the task of the CBI? Yeah, it's very interesting. You know, I feel a little bit guilty uh, when I do webinars with the team because they are, uh, you know, they've had a heck of a year. I mean, look, we've all had a heck of a year. And here I am with a, right, everybody, the future of the British economy. But I do think, I mean, I saw the Chancellor last week. And, and the one thing that we really uh, united around was this idea that this is a, a set of shocks, the likes of which we've never seen for, I don't know, certainly not our generation. And it should be an opportunity to change the trajectory of the British economy, right? There is a, there are a whole set of things that are perennial challenges in the British economy, productivity, biz, levels of business investment, innovation. And gosh, if this set of events doesn't change that or give us an opportunity to change that, what will? But there's also a, I think there's a set of, I'm really interested in this theme of British competitiveness. And in fact, when I went for my uh, CBI interview, the thing that I led with was that the exam question would be, how are we going to build the most competitive economy in the world outside the European Union? For which, by the way, simply extend uh, after the COVID crisis, as well as in a net zero world. Uh, but I think competitiveness, which is, I don't know, I don't know how many of you are students of competitiveness. Competitiveness has been talked about for years and the World Economic Forum have had metrics of competitiveness for years. But I think there's a very modern competitiveness now that you need as an economy to compete in the world. And it's very relevant to Britain. So first of all, net zero, leadership and net zero. And Britain, I think, is off to a good start on that, but it needs to be completed. The second is regional competitiveness. And actually, that's where Britain has not been as good as some of other countries, particularly federal countries like the Germans and the Americans and so on. And I've been speaking a little bit to mayors uh, in the last couple of weeks, as well as some of our regional chairs. Uh, and, you know, any competitiveness strategy for the country needs to have a regional competitiveness strategy, whether or not it's sort of tidal power in the northwest or offshore wind uh, in the northeast. How are our regions going to compete internationally? And then there's something about the world of work. You know, the world of work is fundamentally changing, whether or not that's around mental health and well-being. It's about diversity and inclusion. It's about flexible working. I think these are the kinds of competitiveness criteria that need to be at the heart of a vision for British competitiveness in the future. So one of the things I'm really desperate to do is to get onto the front foot very early in the new year to start to map out a pretty ambitious vision about the British economy and what we're reaching for. Uh, because everybody talks about build back better, but what does better really mean? At the same time, I don't want anybody to be concerned. You know, 
We can't do any of the above until business is back on its feet. And so the priority is going to be Brexit and COVID and also stimulating growth next year. So one of the other things that I spoke to the Chancellor about was, you know, what can we do together to stimulate business investment? So those are the two things, you know, I, I said in my opening speech at our conference a few weeks ago, you know, it's a bit like having bifocal lenses, which I realize makes me sound very old, but you need to simultaneously be focused, I think on a decade, because I think history will show that this was a moment and it's almost the turn of the year, marks a moment in the next decade where Britain has an opportunity and a requirement to change its trajectory. At the same time, good Lord, we're all so busy keeping up with, you know, frankly, keeping the business afloat and getting back to some semblance of normality and growth. So look, my, my pledge is we're trying to do both uh, in the next few months. Can we talk about both separately just for a minute though, yeah. Tony, if you like, there's the sort of the rebooting of the British economy and then there's the recovery post COVID. COVID. On the rebooting, when do you have an idea, I appreciate the point about net zero, about regional competition, right, about the kind of culture and health of the workplace. You hear a lot about digital skills, you hear a lot about a, a reorientation of the British economy, you know, we're seeing fundamental changes, for example, in retail and the high street. Yeah. Do you have already in your mind a theory of the kinds of industries, the kind of composition of the British economy that makes it that most competitive uh, economy in Europe or the world? Yeah, and by the way, you raise skills, which is another one of those long standing challenges, the British economy. And, and again, will that one, like the others, surely is up for grabs at a time like this? I mean, look, I, I think we need to be a little bit careful about sector picking uh, and sector winning. It's definitely true that when you think about international competitiveness, there are some sectors which are much more exposed to international competition. They're internationally traded, financial services, life sciences, advanced manufacturing. And so you should absolutely think about those sectors uh, with a pretty traditional competitiveness lens. What would it take to be genuinely world leading and world beating? Where does Britain have comparative advantage and so on? But I also think it's important to remember that there are lots of non-traded sectors where most of the people in Britain are employed. And that's where some of my old work around uh, you know, productivity and productivity gains and dynamism is incredibly important. You're right, digital adoption uh, you know, and digital leadership in those sectors, uh, employment practices, innovation is huge, entrepreneurship will be very big. So we talk a little bit uh, internally about how do we build a more competitive and dynamic economy. Competitive can be about those sectors that are internationally traded, but most people in Britain are working in sectors which are still going to be around where we need to have productivity gain and innovation and dynamism in order, frankly, to continue to pay higher wages over time. So I, I, I definitely Britain is going to have a leadership position in some sectors, but we need innovation and productivity gains across the economy and in every region. Uh, and, and can I just pick you up on the regional point, the regional competition? Yeah. Um, for all, I haven't heard people talk about that, although you have heard people talk about devolution. And I wonder what yeah. your opinion is of the link between the two. Yeah, look, I think the levelling up discussion, you know, I've spoken to three or four mayors in the last few weeks and I asked them all for their definition of levelling up. And of course, levelling up has been really in concrete terms, a lot of it up to now has been about public investment, right? Changes to the Green Book to stop, you know, favouring the South East, to start getting more public investment into parts of the north of England, for example. The thing I've been worried about is that's great and it will have a, a great long term return. But actually, dynamic business activity and dynamic business sectors uh, built around comparative advantage of the place in which you are is a really important and immediate leveling up objective. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where what the mayors, I think, are interested in, particularly from a devolution point of view, uh, is to be able to have much more flexibility around local economic development strategy and local economic development money. Because then what they can do is genuinely sit with business stakeholders, sit, you know, regional CBIs, et cetera, and build a genuine strategy for this place. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what Manchester did so famously well over a long period. They really built a vision of the city, the area, and how they could compete. They aligned that vision between politics and business. And I think what the mayors are pushing for, whether it's the Northeast, the Northwest and so on, uh, obviously Bristol and the West Midlands, they're pushing for more ability to do that, which will require more devolution of powers, 
and probably a little bit more certainty of money. So one of the things they're most concerned about is that the shared prosperity fund, which was supposed to be the evolution of uh, economic development funding from Europe, uh, would be, you know, they were hoping for a three-year deal or a seven-year deal. Obviously, we had a one-year spending review, so they only have sort of one-year certainty of a small amount of money. Uh, and I think, look, I don't believe that governments alone manage uh, high-performing economies. I think business people do. But what's very important in regions is to have aligned strategies between mayors or regional businesses or labs, uh, sorry, and regional businesses. And I think we need to get onto that agenda as soon as possible. Uh, and Tony, can I just talk about the recovery piece of it? I, I think people, you know, people who are on this call, by definition, will, you know, be aware of the way the CBI works. And they'll have seen, you know, the CBI on, on the on the practical responses to COVID, having been really engaged in the detail, whether it's C bills or bounce back loans or grants or opening rules. The, the one thing that seems to me really difficult to do on the recovery question is the macroeconomic choice that the Chancellor faces, right? Either the, you know, do you spend now, borrow big and save the economy from a certain degree of scarring, but lumber yourself with debt or do you behave in a more you know traditionally quote unquote prudent way but but risk higher levels of unemployment and certain pockets of business failure and i wondered what your read on that choice is and what you think the, your role and the CBI's role is on, on on having a voice in that debate yeah look i i think that's absolutely right uh and i think you rightly identify that the chancellor and all the treasury by instinct Right. Their instinct is always going to uh, be to bring down debt uh, and, and to bring down deficits. And so I think they have been they've done a really good job at recognizing this was an unusual moment in time, an unheard of moment in time. Uh, and so I think they deserve real credit for that. They will want to manage back a transition uh, in terms of the fiscal position, be it on both spending and tax, I assume. Uh, I think what's also clear, though, from some of my conversation. Yeah. You, you were in the Treasury, right? So, yeah. so, so when you say not just the Chancellor, but the whole Treasury, is that just a, it's a culture, it's like a culture of a football team, they, that will be their instinct? Yeah, look, in, in business terms, they're the finance department, right? I mean, they, they, they hate spending, right? They love coming in on budget. So, I mean, it, it's, it's very like that. But I think they are, uh, the whole instinct of the place is, is to rein in spending, to be prudent. They're very sensitive to market sentiment. You know, 10, 15 years ago, obviously, during the financial crisis, market sentiment was really poor on terms of British debt and deficit. It's better now because, of obviously, of COVID. So that gives them some room for manoeuvre. But they will be worried about that. But what I think is also true, almost as a consequence of that, is that there's much more openness, I believe, in government to thinking more radically about competition, about regulation, uh, maybe even immigration, you know, any levers that don't cost money, I think they're going to be highly receptive to. I think mm. they want to be pro-enterprise, uh, Brexit, COVID, they recognize the impact, they want to get on the front foot to stimulate growth. Uh, they just don't have a bottomless money tree, which I think is probably a mixed metaphor. You know, it just if we keep on, you know, rolling up and queuing up and saying, here are all the economic goals for the future of the country and they all need more spending, then obviously the Treasury is going to be wary of that. And I don't think we should have that. Right now, you're right. We need to be concerned about choking off recovery. Uh, we need to stimulate investment. Uh, we need to ensure government does its bit. And we, our members, do our bit. Uh, but I think there might be more creative policy space outside you know, fiscal support. Fiscal support is the order of the day right now. But over time, you know, we're going to be paying down debt. And therefore, we need to be thinking about other policy uh, other policy initiatives, other frameworks for thinking about growth in the British economy, rather than solely relying on fiscal support. So, so Tony, I, I, I remember at the end of your um, speech at the uh, uh, annual conference, you talked about going on a tour of the four corners of the UK from within your, probably from actually that chair. Right here, right here. I did it right here. So I, I, I'd, li I'd like to hear a little bit about what you, what you learned, but I thought I might do that just by asking because i know you spoke to a lot of businesses and a lot of a lot of people but yeah. just to start sort of weighing in some of the questions that we've got Haley chu has written in with this question which is how do you think covid19 has changed the changed the business case of corporate social responsibility and i wonder what you've heard uh, on that yeah look i 
I've been watching, you know, the CSR, ESG, responsible capitalism debate for years. I think something incredibly profound has happened in the last nine months, and see if you agree with me, which is there has been a surge of national interest on the part of business. Uh, I sometimes call it rather grandly business in the service of the nation. And it's an evolution of the typical CSR and responsible capitalism debate, and it responds to the crisis. And at the beginning, you'll all remember, I have been amazed at how many businesses immediately moved to putting people first, putting their staff first, definitely. Uh, also putting customers first. You know, I, I worked with lots of small businesses at the time at Be The Business, and there were lots of uh, family businesses that were taking decisions to close when they didn't need to, because they wanted to protect customers as well as staff. Then we had almost the wartime sort of the wartime support movement, if you will. We had supermarkets investing a lot of money to be able to make sure the food supply kept going. We had the ventilator challenge. Uh, we had obviously vaccines, and we'll hear more about that on Thursday. And right now, almost every business CEO that I speak to, everyone pretty much on my listening tour, talked about mental health. And they talked about mental health of employees right now. And I think this is a new thing that I've never seen, which is business acting in the national interest. Uh, Bill Michael, uh, who runs KPMG, put it brilliantly to me last week. He said, uh, you know, we all play for our club, but when you put on the England journey, jersey or the British Lions jersey, you know, you're playing for something bigger. And I think that has really taken hold as an idea. This is not the war, but it's as close as any of our generation have got to. And I really think business has had a wartime effort. And I think the question going forward is, can we extend that spirit to sort of reconstruction? So I think it's a really interesting idea. And I personally have been incredibly proud uh, of British business in the last nine or 10 months. It, they put people first and they put the country first, despite also having to worry existentially about the future of their business. And I quite like to bottle that and see if we can keep that going when it comes to the stuff we talked about earlier, which is, you know, the next decade for the UK. Uh, and how do you do that? Because some people will think, yes, of course, you know, this this was exceptional, behaviour was exceptional in lots of different ways, volunteers, you know, you know, community, yeah. con is there something that you think is permanent here or do you think more likely than not we revert to the way we did things before? No, I hope there's something permanent here. And by the way, I believe it's the CBI job to make that so. So I think that's one of the things I think we can do. You know, we'll need to change, the CBI will need to change over the next five years. And I think one of the ways we could do this is I'm going to take Bill's metaphor in a terrible direction. You know, if we're, if we're the coach of the British Lions, right? How do we, that doesn't really work. But anyway, you know what I mean? How can we continue to foster that national interest that business playing its role in reconstruction, if you will, and then certainly business playing its role in, frankly, this future of uh, this future of the British economy. And by the way, that is why I want the CBI to do a piece of work early in the new year in the future of the British economy. I, I don't want business to sit around and wait for the government to hand out the country's new national economic strategy, and we read it like it's you know the sort of the COVID uh, you know COVID safe guidance from from Bayes. This, you know, we shape this economy. And I think if we set out a vision for this economy, it will be inspiring, it will be dynamic, it will be practical, and it will be written by the people who then go to implement it. So, and by the way, I've had a lot of good feedback on that idea. If people don't like that idea or they've got some thoughts about how to contribute to it, but certainly the CEOs, the mayors, and the politicians that I've spoken to in the last few weeks, they were excited at the prospect that business would, would actually take the first step in setting out a new agenda for the British economy. And so, look, I think it's the CBI's job to keep that going. Uh, and Tony, can I, can I pick up on a number of questions that have come in around a similar set of themes? One which I suspect is going to be, you know, a, a big part of the next five years, which is around the four nations of the UK. So, for example, just to give you a sense, Jennifer McKeever writes in to say, the CBI has been outstanding throughout COVID and we're grateful for your guidance and leadership throughout. Tony, as a Northern Ireland native, you'll appreciate how delicate and difficult Brexit is for Northern Ireland. As a member here in Derry, I'd appreciate if you continue to keep the Northern Ireland protocol at the top of your the CBI's priority. And then at the same time, David Lonsdale's written in on, on Indy Ref 2. 
you know, congratulations on your appointment, Tony. Uh, he writes, there are Holyrood and Welsh Parliament elections next spring. How is the CBI likely to approach these and also the demands for extra devolution and indeed potentially a second Scottish independence referendum? So, so you want to just talk through your thinking about how you think about Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales? Uh, well, I think about Northern Ireland a lot. My parents are there. Uh, and I can't wait to uh, to get back. And I've had some of my best calls uh, in the last few weeks were with Northern Irish business people, really feeling the pinch of Brexit, the Northern Ireland Protocol, and so on. Uh, and by the way, I, I lived there for the first 18 years of my life, and it's still incredibly complicated. Uh, you'll, uh, I, I spoke to a, a really interesting farm business that uh, that sort of uh, they lay eggs in Northern Ireland, the eggs hatch in Southern Ireland. Uh, the the ducks are reared on both north and south. I mean, it's incredibly complicated stuff. Uh, but I, yeah, definitely got my eye on the Northern Ireland Protocol. I think it's a huge issue. And a lot of, in, interestingly, a lot of GB businesses raised the Northern Ireland Protocol with me in my listening tour. They're the businesses, I mean, people in Northern Ireland will know what this is all about. They're the businesses who are trying to get goods and services in uh, to Northern Ireland from, uh, from mainland Britain. Uh, and that's one of the biggest concerns in Northern Ireland at the moment. So, uh, absolutely, of course, focused on Northern Ireland, but focused on all the devolves and spent quite a lot of time with the CBI chairs, uh, former and uh, current and future in uh, both Wales and Scotland. Look, the only thing I'd say about issues of devolution and issues of the devolved nations is we will be very guided by local members. Uh, this is not going to be London makes a decision. That's almost the stupidest possible thing you could do. Uh, you know, local members will really guide local economic insight, local business sentiment. Uh, creative policy ideas and positions on questions of devolution. We're going to be guided by local members. And by the way, we have a really thriving CBI uh, in each of the devolved nations. So I mean, incredibly, uh, incredibly trusting of our local members and also our regional directors who are all great as well. So one thing I should say, Tony, one of the most interesting things about these calls, particularly in sort of in the months of COVID, as the as the lockdown rules were different between different parts of the country, not not just within England, but between England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, was was also the business not just of local members in the devolved nations, but particularly those ones that spanned them, where they were yeah, on one yeah, end that's right. and their works were another. So I'm sure people will will weigh in on that point in in the weeks and months to come. Can, and James, can I just I just want everybody to be reassured, by the way. I mean, one of the things that's really pleasantly surprised me coming into the CBI just one week in is how effective the network is at listening, gathering, sharing and distilling. Uh, I, you know, my, my, as you can imagine, I have a very uh, long inbox and a lot of that inbox is internal sharing of member insight, be that through formal sources. So, for example, we've got our survey coming out this week, our economic forecast, which is a structured survey of members and, uh, and other businesses or our regional directors speak weekly to sum up what's going on, or we have our chairs committee tomorrow. From, so we've got multiple mechanisms to hearing what you're saying. So please do share with your regional director or through your regional council or through your MyCBI platform, share stuff. I promise you, I hear it really quickly and we use it in our dialogue with government. And in fact, the chancellor shared with me last week that he really valued it during uh, during all the COVID guidelines. We really had very, very live insight and feedback. Sorry, James, I interrupted. No, it was, it was just actually funny if in that spirit, I was gonna say, Greg Kirkman um, has, has written in, and I know you touched on this point, so you don't need to address it further, but just to give you a se sense of kind of the things that you're talking about that are obviously uh, reflected in the conversation that's happening online. Lots of businesses have had to take on debt to survive, not to grow. How can we provide incentives for businesses to grow? And what do you see as the, roles, the role of LEPs in this? Mayors are great, but those LEPs, those LEPs often tie together areas which are not natural fits, which I appreciate was the you know the point you were making in that regional competition conversation we had. Yeah, uh, uh, James, just to say on that, we are putting together at the moment uh, a, a sort of a paper for uh, the Treasury around incentives to invest. You know, business investment. We're going to need business investment to get back uh, to growth. Uh, you know, business investment is a complicated subject, but there are opportunities to really unlock it. One of the things that it, it may not be Greg's sector, but one of the things that we are in particular focused on at the moment is the publication of the Energy White Paper, which has been promised for a long time. Uh, 
we asked, uh, we've asked everybody, and I'm seeing Alok Sharma later today, we'll be asking him again to get that out before Christmas. And the reason why some of these large infrastructure papers, be it on the infrastructure strategy, net zero strategy, energy, are important is because they unlock a lot of business investment. If you can set out you know, a clear regulatory policy framework and ambition ahead, then that starts to build a cycle of investment, at least in those sectors. There are other things we can do across other sectors of the economy as well. All right. Can, can I can either just go back to then Brexit? One question that's come in, which is a longer term question from Jonathan Dunn. Is we received analysis which suggested that the 1st of January would, we would be the moment when the UK and EU are most aligned, whether there's a deal or not a deal, uh, after Brexit, and that greater divergence and therefore greater friction was going to be the direction of travel over time. The, the rationale for this was that divergence ultimately was the was the argument was the ideology of the government. Do you agree with that? And do you think that's likely? Well, I think it depends on what happens this week. I mean, I, I I think if we have no deal and we have a you know a bad faith no deal, then I agree with that. But I I think I feel the opposite if we have a deal. I mean, if we have a deal, it won't be an extensive deal. You know, people call it a skinny deal or whatever. It won't be as extensive a deal as probably most CBI members would have liked. But I do think it, uh, first of all, it achieves a spirit of compromise. It's a trade deal, which is what Britain's going to be doing a ton of uh, in the next decade. And I actually could see things going in the opposite direction. I think I could see us building on that deal, whatever, however skinny, uh, to have closer collaboration. Look, I, we have to remember, this is politics. It's about sovereignty. It's about uh, taking back control. And I think that once that is done, uh, then Europe becomes, by the way, our you know 40% 40, 40 of our trade next door. And Britain has gone on to have fantastic trading relationships with the United States and Ireland, countries with whom we fought wars. So I, I feel differently. I feel the opposite. I think that actually once we take the politics out of this and it's just business again, the way we like it, maybe that's overly optimistic. I, I think the relationship strengthens and I think more gets done once you've removed fundamental sovereignty questions. That might be overly optimistic, but I, I think that's my instinct. It goes in a different direction. Tony, I realize that we're coming towards the end of our time. I just wanted to flag two sort of questions and points for you, something to come back, just sort of, just give you a sort of yeah. move the room, if you like. One's from Juliet Eccleston, who just says, it's great to hear from you and at the uh, Diver uh, Diversity and Inclusion Conference last week. She says, I have a business that's part of the sharing economy and asks what role sharing platforms can play, particularly in the broader you know, ESG debate. And then Brian Raven has just weighed in and asks how much the CBI is willing to work with the B Corp movement. I suspect those are subjects for a, for a longer and deeper conversation, but I just wanted to sort of flag, flag those to you. Um, and, and, and also I wanted to ask you one final thing, which is you talk about a different CBI in the next five years and the things that it needs to do differently. Do you want to start with what you're doing on that front this week? Yeah, so look, Juliet and Brian, please do send in some more uh, thoughts. I'd love to read them. I'm very interested in this idea of the national interest. I mean, I'll, I don't want to sound like a sort of, you know, flag waver, but I do feel a bit flag waving at the moment. You know, I do think there is something about the national interest and that spirit of the national interest uh, and that notion of building, you know, a stronger country, more resilient country and a more, you know, regionally and ethnically diverse, you know, there's a lot that we could be doing together. You know, I'm going to come back to wearing that, you know, the England jersey or the British Lions jersey or the Ireland jersey, as I would probably do. Um, in terms of what's coming this week, look, I think we're very focused. Obviously, we've got to keep an eye on Brexit. You know, if you remember my priorities, right, getting getting business back on its feet. Uh, we're going to keep an eye on Brexit, obviously. We've got a huge amount that we're pushing for in terms of facilitations. Uh, we've got another Michael Gove meeting on Thursday, waiting to hear what that's going to be focused on. Uh, COVID uh, and COVID safe operations and starting to engage with the Treasury and get member insight in advance of the JRS and loans discussion at the start of next year. Uh, one of the things I'm going to start putting some thought to this week uh, is about global Britain in 2021. So uh, we're going to be president of the, of the G7 uh, and we've got COP26 at the end of the year. And so it's actually, I mean, it's sort of brilliantly timed, isn't it? We've got a big agenda uh, and the CBI will want to take a leadership role. More broadly, James, just on this point about what for the CBI, uh, 
once we work out a vision for where we think the economy needs to get to, I want the CBI not just to sort of write a report of that vision and send it into government. I want the CBI to start working with members and playing a leading role in achieving that new economy. So whether it's net zero or diversity inclusion or some of the issues others have raised, how can the CBI be more of an agent for change in our economy? Because all of us are going to need that kind of business leadership to build the kind of future economy that I think is absolutely essential. And arguably, believe it or not, given everything that's happened to us, now is the time uh, to start to build back better, to start to build that better economy. So we need to be at the heart of it. Tony Danker, Director General of the CBI, thank you very much. Great to talk to you. We have, of course, CBI at 10 on Wednesday. We're going to be talking. Ray Newton Smith, the CBI's Chief Economist, will be on with uh, Mel Stride and uh, Lizzie Hills from Burger King. There'll be uh, a conversation about what next in the economy. And then on Thursday, Tony, you and I are back with Ben Osborne, as we said, the MD of Pfizer here. Great. So learn properly about what's happening in vaccines and all the knock-on impacts on on covid and uh, 2021 uh, but for this morning thank you everyone for joining us uh, and a big thank you to you uh, tony have a good week everyone